Releasing in May is a fascinating documentary called Oleg, the Oleg Vidov story. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to the director of this documentary, Nadia Tass. Nadia, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Thank you for having me on Movie Metropolis. I love that title. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I'm named after my favourite film, Metropolis. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> now, Oleg, what a fascinating um, character he is, uh, actor, etc., and uh, vilified a whole range of things that he had to go through. What was the inspiration or origin behind you making this documentary about Oleg Vidov? Um, I He was my friend. Oleg and I used to meet in Los Angeles regularly to have coffee, to have lunch, to have dinner. And we were introduced by his wife, by Joan, who was who's an extraordinary journalist, a wonderful woman. And um, and so, you know, we both love movies. We found that we loved the same type of movies. So this friendship grew over a number of years. And then eventually when uh, he, he wrote his uh, biography um, and there appeared to be a bit of talk between Joan and Oleg about if there was a movie that was going to get made, what would happen? And after Oleg died in 2017, uh, Joan called me and said, okay, I would like you to do this film because you are the right person to do it. What an interesting backstory to uh, this documentary. How how interesting yeah. to hear that. Um, so, Nadia, tell me more. Tell me about the research, the uh, archival footage, the fantastic material that you are able to find about Oleg. Yeah, and it was material that spread all over the world because his connections were from everywhere. And, uh, you know, our meetings were always just so inspiring because we would be talking about movies and we'd be talking about stories and, and Mother Russia and how wonderful Mother Russia was, but very few people knew about it uh, because it was, you know, during the Cold War that, that it was really tainted. The USSR, with the way it was behaving, internationally absolutely tainted uh, the reputation for Russia and Russians. And this was something that Oleg took very seriously, which is the reason why he and Joan took out the rights to the animation series from Russia. And together with Mikhail Barishnikov, they uh, that they polished them up, they revoiced them, and then eventually set them out into the world. This was their way. This was Oleg and Mikhail's way of telling the world that uh, Russia has a beautiful culture, uh, you know, with artwork, with uh, music, with plays, with theater, with with everything, with writing, and they just, uh, with dance, of course, and they wanted the world to know that there was more than the KGB agents that were being portrayed in Hollywood movies, which, of course, when eventually Oleg got to Los Angeles, uh, the majority of the work that he was being offered, even though here was an Adonis a beautiful physically looking man and he was constantly cast as the bad guy because he had that Russian accent uh, until, of course, uh, you know, toward the end when, you know, he was cast in a major beautiful role in 13 days. Mm -hmm. um, so my relationship with him was extensive we had a great friendship and my friendship continues with his widow. 
again, a fascinating story, and and it comes through the his story comes through so strongly in the in the documentary. You've mentioned the animation uh, restorations that he was involved with, and so on, to promote Russia, and yet he was criticised for that by using Bill Murray, American voices, and uh, and Russians uh, were seemed to be offended by that. I, I, again, he he was caught in the middle, no matter what he did. Yes, yeah, but he had to make the decision, and he made that decision that the purpose of these anim or the animation series was to really reach the world. It wasn't to convince the Russian world or the Russian people of how brilliant culturally that part of that country was. So. You know, and he, I, I believe he made the right decision because as a result of that, uh, people from all over the world started corresponding with Joan and Oleg to tell them just how fascinating it was that Russia had all that culture behind it, which they had nothing to, they didn't know about. Yes, Fully agree. I'm glad you mentioned 13 Days because you've got some really interesting uh, interview subjects in your film, including Roger Donaldson, of course. Yes. And so tell me about getting him and, and others, uh, Amanda Plummer and so on, such interesting people. Oh, my God. It was so, so much fun seeking them out, finding them, and then finding that wonderful voice at the other end of the phone saying, yes, of course, I want to talk about my you know, my time with Oleg Vidov, there were, there was, I can't even think of anybody who said no. It was so fantastic to see how much he was adored internationally. And then, of course, doing the interviews with some of the Russian greats was, uh, was phenomenal for me. Um, because they, in, in themselves, they have created such brilliant work. Um, it, uh, you know, and then we had COVID. So, because I began working on this film at the end of 2018 mm. and I finished it and we distributed it or we started to distribute in 2021. Ah. So during that period, I was stumped because I had some interviews and not others like, you know, um, like Mikhail, I ha actually hadn't interviewed him. Uh, so I I had to find a way. I live in Melbourne and we were, of course, we are the most locked down city on the planet. Yeah. Um, and so I had to work out a way to really do all this uh, via technology. And not only that, not only the interviews, uh, but it was also to do some of the reenactments with, you know, restaging that I did, uh, scenes that I did. And the opening scene, for example, I shot in Slovenia. This is when Oleg is escaping from mm -hmm. Moscow to, uh, to Slovenia and then to Austria and then to Italy. Right. So that whole sequence... I did, I, I shot from my studio in South Yarra, Melbourne. Ooh. <laughs> I had four screen, four, yes, four screens and four ways of actually connecting to the crew and the cast, which of course I had to crew, I had to cast, and I had to agree, agree with locations that were being sought. And this was all done via technology. What an incredible process. Yes, it was, you know, I had no idea that we could do this. <laughs> so, uh, and I, I do, I, I speak Slavic, you know, I speak the, the, the general Slavic, which helps me to communicate with a number of different countries that have Slavic as their base. Mm -hmm. So being able to use that, you know, to have that was really such a gift during this period. Um, 
and then of course you know giving the actors instructions uh, over the actors instructions were purely over Skype but the shooting was over different forms of technology that uh, you know I had media player that I was working with mainly and um, it was it was a challenge but we did it well congratulations on all of that that what a fantastic process that in itself is a documentary I think the, the whole way you shot it <laughs> oh god and then uh and then of course uh, you know uh reaching out to Brian Cox yes who, who's the narrator of this um uh, documentary Brian was just so open and so oh he was so amazing actually because he loves Russia he lived in Russia for two years and his daughter still lives there. So he has this uh, this connection. And he was he had such an incredible admiration for what Oleg and Joan did with the animation series and trying to teach the world about this country that he said, yes, of course, I will do it. So he was stuck in upstate New York I am in South Yarra, Melbourne, and the sound technicians were in uh, in New York, like Manhattan. And so we're all trying to navigate our way through technology again and make sure that, you know, the sound that uh, that Brian is getting in his home in upstate New York you know, has got the right timber, the right tone, and there are enough carpets and and uh, curtains and things hanging to absorb the sound, the uh. echo. So it's like a playground. It was a fantastic <laughs> playground for me and seeing how far we could go. And, of course, he was sensational in his understanding of what it what this documentary needed you know the tone that it mm. needed to to be the narrator yes oh he speaks brilliantly and uh and i've met brian a few times so yes he's uh he, he's uh excellent and i notice you've you use costa ronan to voice oleg's uh biography yeah costa was again wonderful i'd seen him in the americans uh and I thought, you know, that's where I thought, oh, my God, he he has such a, a, an affinity. His tone has such an affinity with Oleg's tone. So I reached out to him and um, he knew about Oleg Vidov. You know, I've yet to find Russians who don't know about him, uh, whether they be young or old. It's like the young Russians seem to watch some of the old movies and uh, so they're really familiar with him. So Costa was uh, was totally gung ho about yes, of course. Oh, it's such an honor to be you know doing the voice of a leg, uh, and he's such a great actor. Um, he was able to go into you know the uh, the detail, uh, the minutiae that I wanted him to move into, um, you know, nuance. And so Costa was great to work with. I hope he comes back, actually, and does some work in Australia because he, when he uh, left Russia, he went to New Zealand and then he came to Australia before going to Hollywood. Uh -huh. So uh, I hope some of the filmmakers out there remember that and, uh, and bring him back again. <laughs> Absolutely, that sounds great. Tell me about getting that film footage because having, uh, apart from the archival footage, uh, early Russian footage, all that sort of thing, getting the footage from the various films, Red Mantle and so on, that um, uh, Oleg was in, uh, I can imagine that was not necessarily easy. Very difficult. You know, whereas uh, people, actors, directors and uh, other people wanted to talk about Oleg. Uh, very few people, very few institutions wanted to part with with footage. So we had to, and even, and because it was COVID time, 
we had to be relentless in like Joan and I were just, you know, continuing to badger people about getting the footage. And sometimes, you know, people would ask for money for it. And of course, you know, that was okay. All we needed was the footage. Uh, each piece was really very difficult. Um, ex ex some of the American footage was not because, you know, we were able to sort of connect and and uh, get that. But in Russia, it was hard. And But, you know, at the end of the day, what is easy in Russia? Mm. I mean, and what has been easy? You know, as far as I can tell, it's, uh, it's and my research tells me that the system today is very similar to the system that was there during the USSR. The common, the normal, the, the little person in the streets is suffering. And a, a very small percentage of the elite, which is comprised of politicians or, you know, um, some sort of name people, uh, they're the ones who have built up and with their families and their group, they've built up these fences these, you know, not real fences, but tall fences to keep the normal people away from the places where they eat, where the clubs are, where the coffees are, where, where the stores are, where they can get plenty of food and, uh, you know, different forms of food from the Western world and the blue jeans during that time. So, so these people, these this this group of elite were very easily identifiable by their by their clothing, by their hairstyles, by the arrogance, by the rudeness, and this is what I wanted with this documentary. Aside from telling Oleg's story, to actually show how these the normal people live. You know, the normal families that are in a small confined space and there are, could be eight or six or, or five families in there and they're all struggling to make a cup of coffee or cook some food if they have the ingredients. Mm. And Oleg knew about this. Uh, of course he knew. He lived it. Mm. He lived it and when and his heart was always with the normal people of Russia. Uh, he saw his mother when she was she was part of the Communist Party and she was an incredibly intelligent uh, woman who had reached such heights in the education system during the USSR. She was an inspector and so she was revered and she was working and uh, whilst Oleg was being taken care of by his aunt Nuta. And he saw his mother as soon as the government was done with her, they threw her on the rubbish heap. So mm. that was his understanding of what communism did to people. Yes. And so then when he was in uh, uh, when he was uh, in uh, a at school and Stalin had just died and the children were in assembly and they were all supposed to cry. They were directed to cry because Stalin had died and Oleg was one of the children who was up the front sort of delivering certain messages and when the directive came that everybody had to cry, he looked at everybody who was crying and the stupidity of that got to him and he started laughing. Mm. And, of course, he was punished for that, mm. punished for laughing, you know, that Stalin had died. Uh, so that's where the beginning was for him where he just wanted to do the right thing and to find his own freedom. When he married Natalia, Natalia, who was, you know, part of Brezhnev's inner circle, and he was 
uh, he was offered the position of Minister for Culture. He was an incredibly popular person in the USSR at that time. Against all odds, he was considered to be a hero and a star, where the USSR said, we don't have any stars, and that was crap. Yeah. Um, so he was offered this position, and he said, absolutely not. I will never be a politician. I don't believe in your world. Yeah. And... Uh, so he, you know, so after that, he was a, a man who was going to get killed and they were constantly after him. Uh, and if he hadn't have left Russia, you know, there was no way that he would have been alive for that period yeah. of time. So he uh, he pursued his, his uh, need for freedom. All he wanted was freedom. Yes. And that's what drove him. Yes. And, yeah, drove him to a point where, you know, he would have either survived crossing that border or been killed. We don't know. Mm. Again, such a, an interesting story, which all it comes through, uh, comes through your uh, wonderful documentary. I just wanted to mention you uh, the coup also that you got Walter Hill, uh, because of course he directed Red Heat, and uh, that uh, great to see Walter Hill uh, on, in your film. <laughs> I know, I know. I, it's you know, I was blessed, absolutely blessed, with being able to reach these people and have them say yes. So it was such an honour and it was Joan, it was through Joan that we sort of navigated that path to get to him. But uh, Oleg was loved. Uh, everybody he worked with, it was uh, it was a joy for people to come forward and talk about him. Mm. Uh, and so, yes, Walter Hill in my movie, oh, my God. <laughs> I finished myself. You know, and the other one is Borishnikov. Yes. I can't believe it. he was always a god to me, a god of dance, and and uh, and there he is. He didn't want he didn't want a crew to come into his hiding place again in upstate New York uh, because he, you know, he was afraid of COVID and his mm. family would have been at risk. Mm. And so his beautiful wife Lisa was so delightful. Uh, and so we had her, I had her, uh, set up the camera and then, you know, absolutely pull the trigger whilst I, I did the questioning. And uh, so, you know, the whole thing was like, oh, this is now, this is this part of the game and we have to solve it. What an incredible experience. It's it, it, fascinating. Look, Nadia, I'm intrigued now. Um you had then so much footage, so much material. What was the editing process like for you? Because that must have been difficult. Hideous. <laughs> Absolutely hideous. It was so hard to leave material out. Mm. Because, you know, but what I was constantly guided by was the A story here is the story of Oleg mm. and how he pursued and got to his Point of freedom. The B story is the political uh, landscape that we were navigating or that he lived against and he was trying to escape. And then the C story is the uh, the cinema. It's the, it's the Russian cinema that he was very much a part of and how that was going to be shown. So I really navigated telling, you know, creating this documentary by being very careful with the balance of these three tangents. Uh, and, um, you know, it was Corey Taylor who wrote it. Ah. Was Corey was absolutely amazing. And, uh, so he and I worked together very, very well. Um, he was, uh, and he's died since then. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So this was the last film that he made. Mm. Um, 
And it was uh, an incredible experience, again, working with him. I spent a lot of time uh, in his edit room in uh, Los Angeles. This was in, in the beginning, like 19. And then after 19, after I came back in December 19, I uh, came back to Melbourne. And then after that point, we spent a lot of time on Skype, on Zoom and looking at footage like that and making decisions like that. Uh, so it was, you're absolutely right. It was very difficult to leave stuff out. So there's enough material that we have for yet another film. But, mm. <laughs> um, but it's uh, it was such an honour to really make this. And this was my first documentary. Yes, yes. I mean, what a journey you've had from Malcolm to uh, to uh, Oleg. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least they, you know, it's one name. Like, you know, one is Malcolm, <laughs> the other one is Oleg, and the other one is Amy. And Amy, uh, yep. It's so, it just goes on. I do like films that are really, you know, that really do talk about a character's world, a character's drive and a character's journey. So um, so this was it again. But, you know, there's there's a little bit of humour in this one, but it's certainly more serious. Yes, yes, but an important story to tell. I'm so glad you told it. How did his uh, widow react uh, to the film? She loves it. <laughs> <laughs> she loves it. She's so proud of it, absolutely proud. And, uh, yeah, because she's, um, you know, she wanted to make sure that Oleg's story is out there. Uh, and she was so very much a part of his life. They were an incredible couple together. They did so much together. Uh, aside from the animation series, then, you know, they had some, you know, a flight business that they were doing and uh, all sorts of things. And they kept going back after Paris Troika. Uh, they kept going back to Russia. He, you see... He wanted to escape the USSR, but he loved his country. Mm. And that was a really hard thing for him to come to terms yeah. with. When in Los Angeles, there was, there was something missing. Yes, he had his freedom. He had he was able to work and he was able to create a business. He was a very bright man. And together with Joan, they created the business and beautiful homes and in Malibu and so on. And, um, uh, but, you know, his heart was in Russia and so he kept going back. Mm -hmm. And uh, the wonderful thing is that people remembered him everywhere. So even when he and I would go and have coffee in Santa Monica somewhere, inevitably somebody from you know coming into the uh, into the restaurant or the cafe would come over and go oh leg vidov oh my god and <laughs> want his autograph mm -hmm. so it was uh it was a fascinating experience yes so his wife and oleg were an incredible couple and i have so much respect for who they were together and who she is now right Fascinating story. Again, so interesting. So tell me now about the film releasing uh, in May because I'm so interested now in, in how the film is releasing. Well, uh, it's been pre-bought by SBS. Ah. And rightly so because, you know, SBS represents all of us. I am a migrant as well. Mm. And uh, so uh, it... it and that I'm not really that au fait with exactly what the what the distribution is going to be. Uh, as I keep telling Joan, I'm just the director. So, <laughs> you know, when when we look at it at the end of the day and it's up there and I go, okay. Uh, so I can't tell you too much about that. It's okay. It's all in uh, SBS's hands. That's fine. I uh, I will certainly uh, mention that when when the film appears because I think I was told it is in May that it will be appearing. So that which is excellent. 
Nadia, it's great talking to you, I have to say, and I must ask you, are you working on another film at the moment? Yes, I am. Uh, I Well, David has written two fabulous scripts. This is where, you know, COVID has been a blessing for us because he was able to concentrate on, you know, a single project at a time. And um, so now we're going out with these uh, with these projects, looking for the private investment part of the budget. And then they're both going to be shot in Australia. Uh, one of them has a little bit of shooting to, to be done for the beginning of the film in, in Detroit. Uh, but, you know, they're Australian films. One is a family film and the other one is a psychological thriller, which is going to be shot in the outback. Um, so that's what we're working on. And I have another American film that I'm directing, which is going to be shot in Italy. And we're planning for that to be shot at the end, toward the end of this year. Uh, I'm going to Italy in June where I'm doing location scouting. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, and that's a, that's kind of a, a, a you know, a romantic comedy. So you can see I'm sort of <laughs> <laughs> tonally, I go, you know, many places. Uh, but the reason for that is because each story has its own dictates, its own tone. Mm. And uh, I've been trained classically in the theatre and I still direct theatre. Uh, in 2019, I was directing theatre in New York for that whole year. Huh? So I did uh, theatre, you know, theatre in New York uh, at the Portland stage in uh, Maine. I did New Jersey. Uh, so, you know, all over America. And um, so each play also has its own tone. So that's where... I'm I'm not a director who just let's say or not just but I'm not a director who is who you could say oh she only does comedy or mm. she only does drama or you know children's films um, and working for Universal Disney Warner Brothers all these different studios every time I did something it was kind of tonally different. Uh, and they were, you know, they were really good with that. They being the people who were hiring me because they, uh, when I, you know, pitch a, a project and I talk about how I would do it, they must have liked it. Otherwise, they wouldn't have hired me, I guess. So, yes, I, uh, I am ready to go and shoot some more. Uh, and then I, I just came back from New York a few days ago where I had a reading of a new play that I'm doing there. Yeah. Uh, and so it was, you know, the readings there are pretty fancy where there are backers and, mm -hmm. you know, we had a rehearsal period for the reading, absolutely cast it. And then uh, the backers decide whether they want to back the play or not. And, um, uh, for me, the joy of doing that was really to see how much more refinement, how much more nuance we could get into the into the characters, into the narrative. Uh, and so now the writer is uh, back in her writing space and she's refining it. And then uh, the producers uh, will call me when they're ready to to sort of say, OK, we're doing this. Nadia, I am thrilled to hear about all the projects that you're involved with, that you're keeping busy with so many theatrical, um, cinematic uh, projects. Uh, it is That's great to see, and uh, I'm very impressed. And uh, similarly, I, I was impressed with uh, Oleg, the Oleg Vidov story uh, releasing in May. And uh, Nadia Tass, can congratulations on the film and on all your projects, and it's been such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you for having me on your fabulous show. Thank you. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.